Today we are in Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. If you found it, you can read verse 8 and 9. And whoever is going to read, please pray for the word after reading. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Lord, this is your word this morning, oh God, and we pray that, Lord Jesus, as you have prepared this word, Lord Jesus, and whatever that you have sent it to do in our hearts, in our lives today, Lord, let it do so. If it needs to bring us hope, Lord, let it do so. If it needs to rebuke us, Lord, let it do so. If it needs to guide us, Lord, let it do exactly what you want it to do in our lives today. And Heavenly Father, may we receive it, O oh God, with hearts that are ready and Heavenly Father, ears that are open to hear your word, O oh God, without being distracted by anything or anyone, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, we just want to say thank you, O oh God. Bless your servant this morning. As Heavenly Father, he speaks your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 To those who, who follow our Facebook page, uh, most of our sermons are advertised before time, so you know um, what we're going to be talking about. <coughs> it's going to be a series of which I did not give time. It can take the whole year. It can continue next year. I haven't given it a time per se because there are a lot of things that we'll have to discuss with the series that I want us to deal with. And that is the series titled Biblical Paradoxes. Biblical Paradoxes. I will, I will explain. What is a paradox? Let me start there so that we understand the series that we're going to be engaging in. A paradox is a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement or proposition which, when investigated, may prove to be well-founded or true. That is a definition of the dictionary. I repeat, a paradox is a seemingly absurd or contradictory statement or proposition which, when investigated, may prove to be well-founded or true. Another definition, a statement or proposition which, despite sound or apparently sound reasoning from acceptable premises, leads to a conclusion that seems logically unacceptable or self-contradictory. <coughs> Last definition, a statement that seems to go against common sense but may still be true. So this is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at statements in the Bible that when we hear, they don't make logical sense. But when we investigate, they make, should I say, faith sense. Not logical sense. This is what a paradox is. Sometimes a paradox may make sense. But when you think about it, it doesn't make sense. An example of what a paradox is, more is less. Have you ever heard that statement? Mm -hmm. People saying more is less. It makes sense because you know it. But when you sit down and think about it, actually it doesn't make sense. How can more be less? But when you put it in practicality, more, rather, more, less becomes more. Amen? When you start to apply it, you find that being simple has more impact than trying too much. Amen? Being simple has more impact than trying too much. I'm talking to people who also have an opportunity to preach at your workplaces. Being simple has more impact. Paul says, when I came to you preaching the good news, I did not come with eloquence. I did not come with the wisdom of man, but I declared the truth of the gospel. Amen. And the truth of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. This is the paradox I'm talking about. Because this news is so simple. 
For those who are wise, it does not make sense that we come here every Sunday, we lift up our hands, and we believe it so much that there's someone who hung on the cross. He died, and he rose, and is ascended. Yes. To wise people, this does not make sense. It's a lie. Yes. They think we are crazy. They look at us and say we are manipulating. We are hypnotized. They say it's a white man's religion to keep us oppressed. Because the wise don't understand. But to their simple, it is life to us. To those who believe. These are the are things we're going to be looking at. A paradox. Less is more. Another example of a paradox, the end, it was the beginning of an end. The statement. I think it's there. The beginning of an end. Because also, it makes sense. But it doesn't make sense. Because it's beginning, but it's ending. So these are statements that we're going to be dealing with. We're going to be taking time because I realize some of them, church, out there, people are using such things in scripture to attack the Bible. So I want to equip you so that when they attack, you have a counterattack. Some now stand not to believe the Bible because they don't have a counterattack. So we're going to go through them. We're going to investigate. We're going to check what the scripture is saying. Another biblical paradox that I want to touch on as well. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5 verse 3. It's a paradox. Because we are told you must grow spiritually. You must be fed. You must be full of the spirit. But Jesus comes and says you must be poor in spirit. So how do we reconcile the two? Because now I'm kind of confused. Poor and being filled are not the same thing. Because when we talk poor, we talk lack. When we talk being filled, we talk abundance. And Jesus says it's not the one who's abundant in spirit that owns the kingdom or gets the kingdom. But it's the one who's empty that will gain the kingdom. (laughs) It doesn't make logical sense. Jesus, what are you saying? But we're going to go through it. We're going to check it out. Because one thing about the paradox, especially in the Bible, it goes against the norm. Yes. Church, you must not fit in with the norm. Church begins to fade away when we want to become normal. Mm -hmm. We are not normal. And you must accept it. Yes, amen. If they say you are not normal, say hallelujah, praise the Lord, you can see it. Amen. <laughs> because if they see you as normal, then they see you like them. Yes. Because they think they are normal. Amen. So we're going to be going into such, what is Jesus saying? I need to understand Jesus because now I'm striving to be spiritually strong, spiritually full. But you say, no, I must be poor. If I want to gain the kingdom of heaven. These are paradoxes that we're going to be looking at. I'm not going to explain it now. I want to leave you with a question mark. So that you may come back. We sing songs. Lord, fill me up. Lord, fill me up. Lord, I want to be filled. Lord, I want this. But then we go and we read the beatitude. And it says, actually, you must be empty. Amen? Amen. The Bible is filled with many paradoxes, which when applied brings about a distinction between us and the people of the world. In the worldly standard, a great person is a, wealth, is, is a, is a person of wealth. Yes. But Jesus says, if you want to be great, you must be. You see, it does not make sense. Because in the world, and for me to be great, brother Amos, you must see me on the screens every time. I must be driving a Lamborghini. I must, be, I, I, must be, I must have chauffeurs. Right now my bodyguard should be standing there when I'm preaching. <laughs> Watching you, they should not sleep here. 
<laughs> they should be there, filling up the churches. That says I'm great. Our honorable Bushiri says I'm a great man because of such. <laughs> but Jesus says, actually, no, it's the other way around. A great person is a poor person but a humble person. Amen. So between a, a, a person who's living in poverty and a rich guy who's not saved, the greatest is the one who's poor, according to Jesus. You rush to take pictures with this one instead of rushing to take pictures with this one. Because this is the one to learn from. But we want to learn from Bill Gates. Twist it. You see what I mean? It's a paradox in itself. Because now it goes against the norm. We pray, Lord, I want to be rich. Lord, I want to be great. And the answer is simple. Then humble yourself. Amen. Be the least. Yes. Then you shall be the great. Amen. Because being great is not about being the one who does everything. As we think it is. And many of our young people must be taught this because they are after success and greatness. They step on people's toes. They step on people's heads because they are on their way to the top. And they must be taught that's not greatness. Yes. This is why I want us to go through the series so that I teach what greatness is. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. That even when you can have money and be rich, it does not make you change. Mm-hmm. That in your money you are still great. And it's not money or wealth that makes you great. Yes. It's the attitude of the heart. How is your heart? Then we'll tell if you're great or not. Amen. So next time you see a, a, a celebrity and you think they are great and you know they are not saved, take your camera and tell them, I want you to take a picture with me because I want people to see that I'm great and you are not. <laughs> I'm playing, don't beat you up. <laughs> don't do that. But don't rush to give people titles that they are not deserving of. Yes. No pastor is great because they can preach. Uh-huh. No pastor is great because they know Greek and Hebrew. Uh-huh. <coughs> A pastor is great because he's the least. Uh-huh. In this church, I know I must wash your feet. Uh-huh. It's something I'm willing to do. I'm not here to stand here and shout every Sunday without going down. Uh-huh. I must go down. That's what makes a pastor great. When you are doing something in the church, I must not watch you and say, fix that, fix that. I must be fixing myself. Amen. I must be fixing. Remember, I'm also building like you are building. I'm also being used to build like you are being used. I have not reached the top of the mountain. I'm not at the pinnacle of my service. I come to Bible study not because I'm the pastor of the church. It's because I'm chasing after something. I come Saturday because I'm chasing after something. I'm always not because I'm your pastor. Don't think I'm here because it's pastor. He has to be here. No, you are messing me up. I, I, it's not a must for me to be here. I'm here because I'm also serving the Lord like you are. And that's a great pastor. Not someone who will just point fingers. Stand up. Go fix the kitchen. Look at the mics. Do something about it. Now I go to to, to cook and I say, My child, stand up. (laughs) That's not greatness. That's not what Jesus taught us. That's not what Jesus taught us. When he washed their feet, he says, Do? Do. So if I can't wash your feet, I'm not great. You have a wrong. I'm not a goat. I'm not the greatest of all time. I'm not that. Ziggy, I'm not a goat. If I can't wash your feet, I must wash your feet. Then you can say I'm a goat. Because I can go low. Amen? Paradox. These are things we're going to be looking into. We're going to be dealing with them. We need to know. Listen to this one again. 
Let your mind think. Jesus says in Matthew 11 verse 30, Take my yoke, my yoke is light and is easy. But in Matthew 7 14, he says, The road that leads to heaven is difficult. Jesus, now what are you saying? Because you say, when we come to you, you will give us a yoke that is light and easy. Yes. That means going to heaven must be so simple. Mm-hmm. Then he comes again, he says, but difficult is the road, and let's find it. Yes. Listen to that. This is why you, 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 you must be happy when you find churches not filled that much. I can mm-hmm. Because we are fulfilling scripture. Mm-hmm. Less are the people that find this. That's right. <laughs> When we are playing, we must start to wonder, what aren't we doing? And if we are doing it right, that means we must be less plenty. Others must, as I always say, they must pack their bags and go start churches. Because that's what the church in Jerusalem did. It says 3,000 people were added, and they continued to grow. But they said, we are too much. Let's go out. Yeah. Now the problem with us pastors is when we grow, we think this is a great church. But when you grow, a great church knows it must be less again because others must go out. <laughs> we must go out. This is why church greatness is not according to none. Yes. It's according to faithfulness to the word. Yes. Amen. 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 But I was on this paradox. He says the road is narrow. It's difficult. But he says, take my yoke. It's light and easy. easy. Jesus, you are confusing us. We are so confused now. Because it's difficult, but it's light, it's easy. Where do we stand? It's a paradox. Logically, it does not make sense. It does not make sense. Now, the greatest paradox of them all, church, is a suffering servant or a suffering Messiah. This is the greatest paradox of them all. When we read Isaiah verse 9, I mean Isaiah chapter 9, verse 8, it reads, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his now they are not giving us electricity we are upon their shoulders <laughs> and his name will be called wonderful counsel mighty God everlasting prince of we read that great this is, this is the savior that people are anticipating but again we come to Isaiah 53. Please read it. Isaiah 53. We're going to read all of it. Because now this is the picture that people have of the Messiah. That we know that when he comes back, the kingdom is going to be restored. Jerusalem, Israel is going to go back to the highest pinnacle. We are going to be calling the shots like we used to. No nation can stand against us. Because the Messiah, who, who is the government will be upon his shoulders. He's coming. He's going to be everlasting. He's going to be mighty God. He's going to be the God, king of kings, a great man. But you come to Isaiah 53, and it says, from verse 1, Who has believed our report? Yes. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Mm-hmm. For he shall grow up before him Mm -hmm. as a tender plant Mm -hmm. and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. (laughs) And to us, a son is given, a great man. Now we come to 53, he has no form. Please continue. And when we see him, there is no beauty that Hold you should today. desire him. Mm-hmm. Hold it today. <laughs> we are waiting for a Messiah. You told us the government is going to be upon his shoulders. So we are expecting a very great man. 
But please read the, again the part that you just read. This is the man that now comes into the picture. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. There is no beauty. Listen, listen the scripture is talking about Jesus. When we sing how beautiful you are, oh Jesus, beautiful, oh we, we, we worship the beauty of your spirit. The Bible says there was no beauty in him to look That's at him. Right. Please continue. He is despised and rejected by men. Hold it today. How do you reject your Messiah? Yes. How do you despise your Messiah? You know how? Because this Messiah is not like the Messiah of chapter 9. It's a paradox. <laughs> it seems as if we're not talking about the same person, yes. mm-hmm. but we are talking about the same person. Mm. This is why they despise, they reject him because we are waiting for someone who's great. We are waiting for someone like David, a great man. The Bible says he was handsome, but here we are reading <laughs> opposite. And this man is coming in the order of David, but. There's no beauty in this man. <coughs> Therefore, he's despised, he's rejected. Indeed. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs. And carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Thank you. Now we have a paradox. Because this Messiah is not like the Messiah that they read of. <coughs> this Messiah is coming to nothing but shame. This Messiah is coming to nothing but mockery. When we read about the kings before him, particularly, let's end with Solomon, because those are the two kings that were great in actual fact. Those were kings who such a statement cannot come to them. Because whenever they go to war, they will deal with you. Solomon didn't even go into war. Solomon had peace. Solomon was a man that people could go to and listen to. Now when people are expecting a Messiah in the order of David, a king, 
They're anticipating someone who will come just like them who is great. But you come to Isaiah 53, it turns around. Because there's a reason why he had to come. There's a reason why he had to walk the earth. He says he bore our iniquities. David walked, great men fought for them and he won battles. But he never bore their iniquities. Solomon in all his wisdom never bore their iniquities. Mm. This one who's coming is unlike them. He's going to bear the iniquities of the world. And the Bible says, and the Lord was pleased to crush him. Because he was doing it for you. He took all of this for you. He left all that place. In fact, God now said, you know what? I will not send any man. I myself will go down. Yes. Yes. Right. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. But God with us does not come with the power of the eye. <clears throat> because with the power of the eye, he's supposed to be the richest man in the time. <laughs> but he comes as a lowly man from Bethlehem. Who comes to do something far greater. Far amazing than David ever did. Who speaks more wisdom than Solomon ever did. This is a paradox. And church, let me tell you, this paradox is so important because to date, if you didn't know, the Jews are still waiting for a Messiah. Because the Jews are saying, that Christ, that one who walked with Peter, can't be our Messiah. Because our Messiah must be our Messiah must be awesome. That one, we do not regard him our Messiah. And it's a paradox. And it's, it's, it's unfortunate, church. There are many people who come to church who still don't regard him as Messiah. Right. Just like the Jews. They look at him and they say, what kind of a God are you? Where were you when my family was being killed? You are not God, you are not powerful. This, I think, that are spoken by believers. But I'm not there today. Let me not make things tense. Let me continue with my preaching. All this church that I'm saying points to one thing. And this, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Everything I'm saying, it may seem as illogical, because you are thinking of it from logic, but it points to this fact. Our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. The way God does things is not the way we think he will. We cannot even put him in a box and say this is God. We can't even fall. You see, if you can predict God, you are not predicting my God. Because my God does not operate with man's prediction. This is why they can, we can watch TV and they can tell us tomorrow expect rain. And tomorrow comes, there's no rain. (laughs) Because my God works how he wants to work. And when they are not looking and they are saying it's going to rain 80% showers and he brings 80% and people are flooding. Mm. That's the power of my God. My God. And who says in, in the book of Job when he's talking about God, he says, Job, your righteousness does not make God any great. Right. Your sins don't make him any less God. Yes. We didn't make him God. Yes. We don't make him God. Yes. We don't place him God. Yes. We do not have an image and say it's God. He was God before us. Yes. He's God all by himself. Yes. Whether you are righteous or not righteous, he's God. Yes. Whether you follow him or not. Yes. This is my God. Yes. Circumstances don't change him. Amen. Light or no light, he's still God. Amen. 
His ways are not my way. Yes, His thoughts are not my thoughts. Yes. This is what is coming to. This is a paradox. Yes. Because this does not make logic, God. I think we can do it this way. God says, no. Right. Your way is not my way. Yes. I wrote this on Facebook this week. Blaming God is a subtle pride that says I can do better. Yes. See, when you blame God, indirectly you are saying, God, I can do better than you. Yes. When you blame him, indirectly, in your mind, you think you can do better than And any who again speaks to Job, he says, Job, since you sound like you are better than God, since you are making statements like you are better than God, where were you when he told the snow to come? Yeah. Where are you when he holds the lightning and the thunders in his hands? Yeah. Church, we have no power to be God. We are incapable of being God. You, you, one says, what, some people say you can't even stand to look at the sun yes. for more than two minutes. That's right. God oh, placed Lord. the sun. The sun. Amen. We are incapable of being God. No matter how intelligent you think you are, yes. you are incapable of being God. Yes. Even if you can be from Limpopo and you can call lightnings upon people, <laughs> <laughs> you are incapable of being God. <laughs> Even if you think you can do that, you can't be God. <laughs> Even if you can call yourself a Miss Apula, you can't be God. Mm. That's right. You can't. Yes. We're incapable of being God. Amen. Because His ways are not our ways. Yes. If you were God, you would focus on yourself only. Don't lie to us. Yes. If you were God, you would just make sure that you are okay. <laughs> you would call all the cars you want. You, the house you want, you will think about me later. Only when I come knocking and I say, Hush, did you forget about me? Then you say, oh yes, you are alive. But God has each and every one of us in his mind. Yes. We are incapable. Imagine how many churches right now are open and his presence is in every church. Yes. He's not just here. He is somewhere in Cape Town with people who are worshipping. Yes. You can't be God. You can't. The power of God is so amazing. Amen. I was thinking about it and I said, winter in South Africa is summer yes. in New York. Yes. What kind of a God is this? <laughs> There's no Big Ben can do this. No. You tell me about Big Ben? There's no Big Ben. This is all that you can tell. Yes. You can, why can't it be summer for all of us, winter for all of us, yeah. but we have to go according to area. And you tell me God has no power? His ways are not other ways. His thoughts are not other ways. But here is the context of the scripture. Before we go out of it, let me quote what Dr. Thomas Constable says in context to the scripture. He says, repentance is not something a person must do before God will accept him or her. It is simply a description of what seeking the Lord looks like. So you don't repent to be accepted by God. You repent to show God you want him. Amen. We, we, we call it in Hebrew. Alan is not here. Teshish. But when you repent, you're not saying, God, I'm repenting, now accept me. No. Repent is you saying, God, I want you. Amen. Therefore, you follow him and you forsake everything that he does not want. Yes. The theme of us thinking that we must fix ourselves to come before God is a myth. Yeah. You will never fix yourself enough for God. Amen. Only he can fix you. Yes. This is why our lifestyle is a repentant lifestyle. Amen. Every day, every second, every hour we are repenting. Amen. That is what repentance is. It is turning your back on sin yes. and turning to God. Yes. 
Yes. Not turning your back on sin and staying there. But you turn your back and you go to God. Amen. And this is our daily lifestyle. Yes. Every day we are neglecting things that God does not want. This is why no one can come here, church, and say, I am whole. We are all sick. Yes. Yes. Myself standing here. Amen. We are all sick. Amen. Jesus says, I did not come to call those who are well. I came for the sick. Yes. So if you say you are well, you've just declared that you don't need Jesus. Yes. You and I are sick. We must be like that guy who comes into the temple and he approaches and he says, Lord, I'm a sinner. Unlike that one who comes and says, I fast twice a week, Lord. I do this. And Jesus says, actually, the better one between the two is the one who says, I'm a sinner. Not the one who says, I do this. According to the eyes, the better one is the one who fasts twice. Mm-hmm. But according to the Lord, the one who confesses they are empty, yeah. they will be filled. Amen. Paradox Amen. goes against the norm. Because his ways are not ours. His thoughts are not ours. Amen? Amen? Let me continue with the quotation. He continues to say, in other words, Cleaning up one's life is not a precondition for acceptance by God. The person who genuinely seeks the Lord and calls on his name has come to grips with his or her sin and is willing to turn over to the Lord. Come to terms with the fact that you are a sinner. It's the day you come to fact with that, that you are a sinner, that you can be saved. So long as you think I am righteous, I am doing it well. God sees me. I'm his favorite child. Daughter of the Most High. Come down. (laughs) Come down. Come down. Come down. down. This is why we can point at people and say, you are going to heaven, you are not. You are, you are. Come down. You yourself, you must check yourself. Are you going to heaven? Before you point at others. It is easy, church. It is easy to see the sins of others. Jesus said it. It is easy. It is easy to remove the the log, or rather the speck, and leave the log on your own eye. It is so easy. It is so easy. It is easy to drink coffee and gather people and talk about me and say, who pastor? And make yourself righteous. Mm. And enjoy your coffee. Mm. And drink. And have biscuits. Mm. With my name on the table. (laughs) It is easy to do that. It is easy. But now let's talk to you. What about the log in your eye? What about the log in your own eye? What about the log in your eye? Before you point at others, look at yourself. Introspect yourself. (laughs) Don't be that Pharisee. Don't be a Pharisee. God, you know for Bible study, I'm there. Come prayer at 8, I'm there. Thursday, I'm there for prayer. Sunday, I'm there worshiping. Others don't even make it, Lord. Hey, <laughs> come down, come down. His ways are not your ways. His thoughts are not your thoughts. Someone comes and they testify here, and you say he's been in the church for two weeks. Lord, how long should I be praying? His ways are not your ways. Not your ways. Let someone who comes into the church today testify next week and you've been there for two years and your situation is not changing. It's fine. His ways are not your ways. He knows what he's doing about you specifically. (sighs) 
In other words, church, in this scripture that we are reading, as we say, my thoughts, or rather, God is saying to us, turn from your wicked and evil ways. Amen. Isaiah is kind of, in a way, quoting Proverbs indirectly when it says, there's a way that appears to be right, according to a man, but the end leads to death. I'm talking to those who say, trust my, I trust myself, uh, believe in yourself, <laughs> listen to your heart. <laughs> it's, it's not biblical to listen to your heart, because your heart is deceitful amongst all else. Who can know it? Even you don't know it. <laughs> it's as if that's what it's saying now, that there's a way that seems right according to you. You think getting this job is right. Only to find it may lead to death. You think worshiping in this way is right. Only to find. This is why we don't tell God how we want to worship Him. He tells us how to worship Him. And then obedience is us doing it. But we have turned the tables around. We want to tell Him, this is how I worship at this time, in this place. And that is what Jesus was coming against. Mm -hmm. We don't worship him here Sunday. Mm -hmm. You don't worship him when the song starts. That's right. You worship him daily. Amen. The song must not dictate your worship. That's right. The place must not dictate your worship. Amen. The hour must not... Three o'clock, I'm waking up. It's my time of worship. The hour must not dictate your time of worship. You are a worship living. Amen. If I should say that. Your steps are worship. Amen. Every breath you take must worship God. Hallelujah. This is what you say. That there's a way that you think. This is why you must not rely on your own thinking. Amen. Don't rely on your own thinking, on your own mind. Don't rely on it. Its end is death. Yes. Rely on Him. You don't know any better. Yes. I just say, you can't be God. Amen. You don't know any better. Mm -hmm. It's as if this is the quotation that we have come to in the scripture that we are reading. He's quoting Solomon. The idea behind all this church is to show us that there is no good in man. There's nothing good about you. We all need to repent. Yes. Amen. Naturally, there's nothing good about all of us sitting here. Naturally. Never think that I'm a great, I'm a good person. Naturally, we are all. We are all. And we need Jesus. We need Jesus. This is, this is the point of the scripture. This is what we are coming to. This is what we are coming to. Let me, let, me, let me read it. Let me read it and close. Let's start from verse 1 of Isaiah 55. Because it's very important for us to see what repentance looks like in itself. Verse 1. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Hold it there. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's like this guy is saying, go to your favorite restaurant <laughs> and just sit there and eat. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> when they give you the bill, look at it. Stand up. And leave. <laughs> it's as if that's what he's saying. It's as if he's saying, go to Woolworths, take your shopping, put it inside the trunk, and enjoy. See that free range, whatever, what range, whatever you call it. Put it inside. See the whole wheat, Uncle Moses. Put it inside. Go to the tailor. When they look at you, don't look at them, just pass. <laughs> Just pass. Because he said, come back. 
without money. How do I buy without money? It means the price has been paid. When it starts there, there's an important word. It says hope. That calls you to attention. Isaiah is saying, pay attention to this. It's very important. God is calling us to come by even when you don't have money. He's calling us to come drink when we are thirsty. And we don't have to pay anything. Because the price has been paid. Not half. It's not a discount. It's been paid in full. This is what he's saying. Verse 2. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Hold it. So he's saying you are going to Woolworth and you are yes. messing your money because you are buying the wrong thing. Yes. Because you buy it this month. Guess what? Next month you must go back. Yes. But come and buy for free. Amen. What do you buy this month? Amen. Next month is still available. Yes. Jesus says to the, to, the, to the woman at the well, you who drink from this well will be thirsty again. Yes. But I have water that when you drink from me, you will thirst no more. I have bread, yet when you eat of it, you will have hunger no more. This is the gospel. It's not cars and houses. Because those don't satisfy. They will pass and they will perish. Floods will come and they will move those away. But what we are talking about here, neither death, Neither grave. Nothing can separate you from what we are talking about. It's eternal. Let's, let's close it. Let's continue. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Yes, continue. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Listen to this. I will not make a part-time covenant. Everlasting covenant. <laughs> it means it's eternal. This Amen. covenant we are in is everlasting. Amen. It is everlasting. Amen. Continue. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord. While he may be found, call upon him while he is. Please, here. please, please read that one again. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Hold it there. Let's debunk this thing. There are people who think there's always time to seek him. There will be a time where you will not find him. That's right. There will be a time where you will not find him. I'm talking to those who say, I will repent. My time to repent will come. Let me enjoy my life. I'm still young. Let me enjoy my youngness. Yes, life would begin at 40. Then I will start to repent. Because I've seen that this Christianity is better for people like Uncle Moses. We are still young. We want to enjoy ourselves. There will be a time where you won't have the time. You will seek him now. You will knock on the door. And they will be shut. Because you'll be looking for him, but you will not find him. I always I say this. It's said lately, I see death of young people more than the old people. Yes. It's like on Facebook, every time I go, people are posting, too soon. Not you. Too soon. And I'm saying, we don't have time to repair. We can't make time to repent. Repenting must be now. 
Because you think you will have time. But on the other side of the grave, when we just put the soil and we close, you will not knock. If you go to your neighbor, you won't find Jesus. You will find bones. If you go to the other neighbor, you won't find Jesus. You will find bones. Because on the other side of the grave, there is no repentance. That's right. <laughs> Repent today. <coughs> no, it's okay. Let me fornicate. He will marry me. Repent today. Amen. Marry that person if you want to do the deed. Because you will die on your way home. And you won't repent. You will die on your way from the groove. You won't have time to repent. We will see you while we are on the other side. And you'll be saying, please, I just need a drop of water. Yes. And we'll be saying, we can't. We can't. That's right. And then you'll be saying, that, please go tell my brothers. Again, we say, we can't. That's right. There are people, let them listen to them down there. Because you fail to listen to us now. Repent now, today. Amen. Fix your ways with the Lord. You won't, you won't have time. You won't have time. The world can end as soon as I say amen. It can end. Fix your ways. If you have to send them a text, send, send a text and tell him or her, are you ready to marry me? If they say no, say this is the last text you, see, you, 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 you will read from me. And say bye. And lock them. Let them come with the cows and knock. And say, We are, we are here now. Let them bring the cows. We want the cows. That's why I want daughters. I want the cows. <laughs> we want the cows. We want the cows. I want someone to feel the pain I felt <laughs> when I was going. <laughs> we want the cows. I want to fold my arms and watch that dead that, that son and see him suffer. <laughs> what the, what, I want the stress. Hey, hey, hey I know that stress is. Hey, 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 hey. I, I know the stress. What the, but you must fix it. Sleeping with that young girl and you're not married to her. It's nice, but it's sin. It's leading you to death. Taking that brandy and saying, I'm healing whatever you are healing. It will numb the pain, but it's leading you to death. Mm. Finding pleasure in gossip is nice because you have stories to talk about, mm. but it's leading you to death. Mm. It's leading you to death. And we must repent, church. Yeah. Please continue. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Hold it there. Now we're going to come to the important thing. Because now we have built it up. It says, listen to this. We wicked men who must forsake our ways. Yes. We wicked people we must forsake our thoughts. This is why Jesus had to come now and say, you think, you think adultery is when you do. But even when you think about it, you have committed adultery. Yes. Because our thoughts are filled. That's right. <laughs> Now he comes and he says, Let him return to the Lord. Yes. And he will have mercy on us. He has mercy on us. Amen. Why? And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Yes. Because. For my thoughts are not, are not your thoughts. Yes. Nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Amen. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As I close, church, these are three things I wanted to observe quickly there. One, God's ways are perceived by faith and not by logic. God's ways are perceived by faith and not by logic. Never think you can perceive the ways of God logically. It's not logical. It's not logical that someone hung on the cross and they died. But by faith, it makes all the sense I need in the world. It's my salvation. It's my salvation. It's not logical that I have to go through all these troubles. But by faith, God is working something out. 
Because if you want to see something with the logic and you want to make sense of something in the God way, then it's not God, because God should not make sense. And let me, let me put you at ease. It's okay for you to not make sense of God. Yes. Don't feel like you are a sinner. It's okay, because His ways are not your ways. By virtue of that, you will never make sense of God. Yes. Who thought poor Joseph will have to go to the pit and go to Potiphar's wife and do all these things for Israel to be saved? Who thought that? No man! It doesn't sound logical that people to be saved, someone had to suffer like that. But by faith, we perceive it. It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. Evidence of things not yet seen. Evidence of things not yet seen. Because if you see it, it makes sense. If you don't see it, it's faith. It's faith. Number two, I want to close. I'm done. I've said this. Trust not in yourself. This is what the scripture is coming to. Don't just put your trust in man. Even in yourself, don't trust yourself. Point number three that we see in the scripture altogether. True success is submission to God. Success, as I said, it's not all the wealth and all these things that we chase. Success is submission to God. What is submission to God? When he says left, you say left. When he says right, you say right. When he says stop, you stop. When he says jump, you jump. When he says shout, you shout. When he says shut up, you shut up. Amen. This is submission. Amen. Even when he says shut up, and you know you've got all the words to say, and whatever you say can get you out of trouble. If he says shut up, shut up. Amen. One day maybe we must talk about that. Maybe that needs to be a sermon for one day. Shut up. <laughs> Especially as believers, we need to hear this more often. We talk too much. We must learn to shut up. And it said, we are the people who are told that we must think, we must hear more and not and speak less. But we are the people who talk too much and we don't hear. Must shut up. Must shut up. As I conclude, church, a paradox may cause tension. But in this case, we see that a paradox is for our good. Salvation has come to us, and we must seek the Lord while he can be found. Call upon him while he is near. As we go through this series, what I aim to do is to stretch our faith, for us to get out of logic and start leaning on faith. Because we lean too much on logic. It is logic that makes me wonder, should I sing and dance? Because you are still asking questions in your mind. Faith won't make you ask such. Faith will say, he has done so much for me. Therefore, I can sing and dance. Amen. Logic will give you all the reasons you should not be shouting. But faith will give you something to shout about. Amen. Faith will make you to go around Jericho seven times. Hallelujah. And you'll go the first time and the walls won't fall. Yes. You'll go the second time, the walls won't fall. You'll go the third time, the walls won't fall. You'll go the fourth time, they won't fall. You'll go five, they don't fall. Six, they don't fall. Seven, they don't fall as well. And you go seven, seven times, they don't fall as well until you shout. Amen. Only faith will say shout. Amen. And you will say shout because logic will say, Lord, we've been going around. It's now seven days. But faith says, because he said it, Israel, let us all shout. Amen. And when you shout, all the walls go down. 